All right, this is uh, part three of the red heifer, and we're going to pick up in verse 11, read to the end, and then we'll go ahead and look at these verses. All right, so Numbers 19, verse 11 to the end. He who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. He shall purify himself with water on the third day, and on the seventh day he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day, and on the seventh day he will not be clean. Whoever touches the the body of anyone who has died and who does not purify himself defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. That person shall be cut off from Israel. He shall be unclean because the water of purification was not sprinkled on him. His uncleanness is still on him. And this is the law when a man dies in a tent. All who come into the tent and all who are in the tent shall be unclean seven days. And every open vessel which has no covering fastened on it is unclean. Whoever in the open field touches one who was slain by a sword, who has died, or a bone of a man, or a grave, shall be unclean seven days. And for the unclean person, they shall take some of the ashes of the heifer burnt for purification from sin, and running water shall be put on them in a vessel. A clean person shall take hyssop, dip it in the water, sprinkle it on the tent, on all the vessels, and on the people who are in the tent, or on the one who touched a bone, the slain, the dead, or a grave. The clean person shall sprinkle the clean on the third day and on the seventh day. And on the seventh day he shall purify himself, wash his clothes, and bathe in water, and at evening he shall be clean. But when the man who is unclean does not purify himself, that person shall be cut off from among the assembly, because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of purification has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. It is a perpetual statute for them. He who sprinkles the water of purification shall wash his clothes, and he who touches the water of purification shall be unclean until evening. And whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean, and the person who touches it shall be unclean until evening. Okay, verse 11. He who touches the dead body of anyone shall be unclean seven days. Verse 12. He shall purify himself with the water of the third day, and on the seventh day he will be clean. But if he does not purify himself on the third day and on the seventh day, he will not be clean. Touching a dead body makes you unclean seven days. What is this pointing to? If this is to be taken literally with no symbolic picture, then what is the reason for this law? If you're going to be unclean seven days, even if you purify yourself on the third day, then what is the reason? Can't this offering cleanse you immediately? If the clean are only unclean until evening, do they have to purify themselves on the third day? Okay, if you miss the third day, will you be clean? Okay, there's no other option given here. So there's something else about these days that this is pointing to. And this is a picture of us in our bodies of death, touched by Adam for seven millennial days. We need to be sprinkled on the third day, pointing to Christ. We need to be sprinkled with Christ, and we will be clean on the seventh day. Okay, this is a symbolic picture of us being unclean with death until we get our glorified bodies on the seventh millennial day so we can enter the garden. And please remember, like I've said before, that anytime you're looking at Scripture, look for the bigger picture that's in the smaller pictures being portrayed in the physical in the scriptures here. Just like God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh, we have six millennial days of time that we're going to be here on earth and we're going to have our Sabbath rest on the last millennial day, the 1,000 year period. A thousand years is but a day to the Lord and a day but a thousand years. And this is what this is alluding to. You have seven 1,000 year periods called millennial days that we are living in right now. And if we are not purified by himself by the third day or on the third day, this is pointing to Christ, then we will not be cleansed on the seventh day when all this comes to a close before the eighth day the new beginnings and everything is thrown death and sin is thrown into the lake of fire in revelation so that's what this is pointing to and you'll see this a little better when we start getting into this a little further 
Okay, Hebrews 10 to 22, it says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. If you are cleansed from death by the red heifer, you can never die. Your conscience has been cleansed, your sin and your body from death. This is by his blood, Jesus Christ, and you are only unclean until evening. Your day is done. This offering is cleansing you from sin and death. That's the physical picture in this. Look for the spiritual understanding found in Christ. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 57 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass, saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what this is referring to. <clears throat> so let's go to verse 13. Whoever touches the body of anyone who has died and does not purify himself defiles, defiles the tabernacle of the Lord. That person shall be cut off from Israel. He shall be unclean because the water of purification was not sprinkled on him. His uncleanness is still on him. When you look these words up, the word touches the body of anyone who has died. It says, Ha'adam asher amut nefesh. Now, does anyone remember what nephesh is? This is talking about the soul. This goes back to the garden. And the Adam who had the dead soul, if you transfer this out, touches the dead body of anyone who has died. Ha'adam asher amut nephesh, the Adam who dead soul. So this is really pointing back to the garden when Adam's first sin brought death. Uh, the body of the man that has died is referring to Adam who died. And it says in Genesis 2.17, But of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat of it. For the day that you eat, you shall surely die. And this word shall surely die in Hebrew is mut ta mut. Dying, you die. This is showing us two deaths here. So keep in mind that Adam died in the day that he sinned. And he did. There's a smaller picture and a bigger picture. Did he die in the day, the 24 hour that he sinned? He did spiritually. Did he die physically in the 24 hour day that he sinned? No, but he did die in the thousand year millennial day that he sinned. A thousand years is but a day and a day, a thousand years to the Lord. So he did die, dying he died. And that's what this is pointing us to. Whoever touches Adam, the death in the soul of the dead man, his sin caused death that was transferred to us. Okay, we have touched Adam's sin. And this is stated in Romans 5.12. It says, therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all have sinned. Okay, when they laid hands on animals and transferred sin to them, it was a picture, a future picture of Christ having our sins transferred to him. All right, the last Adam, Jesus, took away our sin that the first Adam, man, brought. And more importantly, he cleansed our soul, our nephesh, that the first Adam corrupted. Okay. The phrase does not purify himself. Can anyone purify himself? No, someone else has to do it. Typologically pictured, he needs to be sprinkled with someone who is clean. Okay, when we are sprinkled in Zorach, it implies that we receive it. This is free will, if you want it. Okay, the other sprinkling that is done in the altar 
uh, in the tabernacle was splashed. So there's two kinds of splashings. There's one that splashes that's given, and there's one that sprinkles that implies being received. Okay, this is not happened by accident. You are not cleansed unless you want to be cleansed. You have to bring your offering. You have to want to be sprinkled with Christ, which requires repentance from your sin, turning and heading towards the altar, Christ, and coming with your offering to God. You have to receive the sprinkling, the way, the door, and you need to come to God and allow yourself to be sprinkled and receive it. That's what this is implying. So don't think this says that you have to cleanse yourself. You need to purify yourself. You can't do it, but you need to do what you can do, and that's receive it as a gift. Okay, when do we see the blood and water at the cross? When we see the blood and water come out of the side of Jesus, out of his womb. This sacrifice was to cleanse us from death, which is what Jesus did. He cleansed us from death. And I think Mel Gibson did a good job, if you watch The Passion of Christ, when he portrayed this sprinkling. Uh, I never will forget that image. I, I think that is a very good understanding spiritually of what happened physically. Okay, in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, it says, Knowing that you are redeemed, not with corruptible things, with silver or gold, from your vain manner of life, handed down from your fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb, without spot, even the blood of Christ. Okay, verse 14. This is the law when a man dies in the tent. All who come into the tent and all who are in the tent shall be unclean seven days. What is this picturing? Okay. I believe this is a picture of our coming into the world conception, coming into an unclean womb, an unclean tent, living in our bodies in uncleanliness, in an unclean tent. We are defiled in our tents. Psalms 51, 5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. When you go back and read Psalms 51 after this red heifer study, you will see red heifer all over in this uh, psalm. So I believe that this is a picture of us living in our unclean, corrupted tents, our tabernacles, our bodies. So our bodies first need to be cleansed by the blood of the third day, and we will be cleansed on the seventh for glorification. If we don't cleanse our tents, our tabernacles, on the third day, then we are spiritually dead, and the Holy Spirit cannot come into us and cleanse our insides. We will find ourselves in the lake of fire on the end of the seventh day. We will be dead, spiritually dead and physically dead. Okay, Jesus did not have the stain of Adam's sin. This is why the virgin birth is so important, okay? Jesus was not a part of Mary's egg. He could not have been because Mary carried Adam's death. Everyone from Adam on was tainted with his corrupted uh, natural sin, his sin nature. If Jesus would have had Mary's egg, Jesus would have had Adam's sin tainted, but he was the second Adam that came to take away our sin and death. Now picture that. Adam was the first Adam who was made clean, perfect, unblemished, but yet he sinned and he became defiled. Now he passed on all that defilement all the way through us. Jesus Christ was made as the second Adam, undefiled, unblemished, and he was placed in the womb of Mary. Now, remember that just placing you in the womb doesn't mean that you are tainted but with Adam's sin. The blood does not go through the placenta. You are merely a host for the infant who is growing. The infant is totally separate from you, uh, from another person. 
It is only using the placenta to gain its nourishment. The blood doesn't pass, the defilement from Adam does not pass to the baby. Therefore, Jesus remained his own entity, his own spiritual, his own physical being, just like the babies are in the womb today. They have a different blood type, they have a different gender, and if this blood would end up mixing with the mother's blood, it would kill it. So as, as a uh, invader, okay, it would recognize the baby's blood as an invader and kill it. It is separate. And Jesus Christ was placed in the womb, separate from Mary's contaminated sin from Adam, okay? So that's why this virgin birth uh, understanding is so important in this red heifer, the red virgin. Okay, <clears throat> verse 15. And every open vessel which has no cover fastened on it is unclean. Okay, every open vessel that doesn't have a samid. I looked this word up. This is very interesting. This word samid is used to do cover. And when I looked it up, it's bracelet. And... Where else in scripture have you seen this word bracelet? Okay, we are a person, we are a vessel, and we need to have a covering according to this, but it's not kippur, it's bracelet. Who has no bracelet is unclean. Where do we see this word bracelet? It's in Genesis 24, 22. And now you'll see why some of this I used in Genesis 22 was coming to pass here. And it says in verse 22 of 24, And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of a half shekel weight and two bracelets for her son and ten shekels weight of gold. Here is the bracelet. Here is when Eliezer goes into the world gets his bride and brings him back to Isaac. This is a picture of the Holy Spirit coming into the world, getting the church, us, all the ones who believe in Christ and want to come into his covenant will wear the bracelet, will accept the Holy Spirit, will receive the Holy Spirit and will be made his. You need your bracelet in order to be Christ's bride. So that's what I believe this is pointing to you accepting this marriage proposal and wearing the bracelets, wearing the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> okay, this word is not translated covering here. It was kippur. Why? Who is our covering? Jesus. And I believe this is a double picture understanding that if you do not have a covering, the tola, covering you, the vessel, you're protecting you under this shell of protection that's built into this tola imagery, then you are not protected and you are unclean. Okay, if you have not accepted Christ's marriage proposal, you will not be wearing the bracelet. And thus, you are not covered. You are unclean. So I think this is kind of interesting how the Jewish people wear those kippahs on their head. This is a physical picturing of being covered. Okay. You had better be covered spiritually. That's what this is pointing to. You had better have your tola, your samid, your bracelet. Uh, and Christ will cover you. He is our covering, our kippah. But you'd better accept the marriage proposal Christ gave us that he offers. This kippah is a physical picture of the spiritual understanding we need to gain, okay? Verse 16, whoever in an open field touches one who was slain by a sword, who has died, or a bone of a man or a grave shall be unclean seven days. Now, this is a picture of us being touched by Adam's sin, death, touching each other in sin, and we are unclean seven millennial days. This, uh, Show, takes us back to the six-day creation and the six-day millennial day uh, that we're in right now. And we're coming up on the seventh millennial day. This is a small picture, big picture. Okay, verse 17. 
And for the unclean person, they shall take some ashes of the heifer burnt for purification from sin and running water and shall put them on a vessel, living water. Living water pictures Christ. He is our living water. The blood pictures Christ that was burned as the heifer to dust. So you have water and blood. We are a vessel needing to be cleansed. We need the living water and blood, not only on us, but in us, in our vessels. We need to eat and drink his blood. Jesus' first miracle was changing water to wine in vessels at a wedding feast. Okay, there were six purification pots, interesting enough. And this six is the number of work days before the Sabbath, the seventh, right? Okay, living water turned to wine. This was symbolic of the blood that he gave for us to drink. Uh, Jesus was also fulfilling scripture that says that the Messiah will come as one like unto Moses. Moses' first miracle was changing water to blood. So was Christ changing water to wine, symbolic of blood. So his first miracle was changing water to wine at a wedding feast in purification pots, showing that he would be the one that cleanses his bride. We also kind of see a uh, symbolic picture in the woman at the well in John 4 when uh, he wants to give the woman in the well living water so that she'll never thirst again. This, this comes into play here also. So, okay, verse 18. A clean person shall take hyssop and dip it in water, sprinkle it on a tent, on all the vessels, on the people who are there, or on the one who has touched a bone or a slain or a dead or a grave. So who is the clean person here? What made him clean? It was the waters of purification. So who is the clean person sprinkling people today with Christ? Someone who's already been sprinkled with the waters of purification with Christ. This is symbolic of us. We've already been sprinkled with Christ. We've already been sprinkled with the gospel and have received it. It's a rock. We accepted and received the gospel. And now we are made clean until the end of our day, but we can still sprinkle the unclean with the third day, okay? With hyssop symbolizes meekness and humility, gentleness and respect, okay? Philippians 2.8, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. We are now the priests that have been cleansed with the sprinkling of the ash of the red heifer, Jesus, the blood and the water. He is the blood. He is the waters of life. Now, we who are clean can sprinkle the unclean. And we don't need a children to sprinkle us. You remember when I started off with this uh, story of the temple in part one? about how they were able to cleanse the high priest with the children who supposedly have not sinned yet. And uh, they used the children to cleanse the high priest. Well, guess what? They're still tainted with Adam's sin. They were still unclean. And we are still unclean until we come under Christ and we come under his blood and his living water then we are cleansed from adam's sin we will never die our physical bodies will die but our spiritual will not we can never die christ has cleansed us but yeah we are going to be unclean until evening until the end of our day and christ is going to reunite us on the seventh day with our cleansed bodies and our cleansed souls and we will live forever. <clears throat> All right. So Christ is clean. And because Christ did not have sin imputed to him from Adam, he was born of a virgin, remember? Symbolic of the heifer, not a cow. The first Adam was created undefiled, but sinned, causing death. The second Adam remained undefiled and without sin. But he bore our sin as the priest did when they ate the offering. He carried it away, symbolizing the Azazel goat, carrying our sins into the wilderness. He was 
only unclean on the outside with our sin. But he remained clean internally. He was undefiled. His death cleansed us from sin and death. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says, Him who knew no sin be made sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This offering is the only one that can purify the inside of a clean conscience. Okay. Verse 19. The clean person shall sprinkle the unclean on the third day and on the seventh day. And on the seventh day he shall purify himself, wash his clothes, and bathe in water. And on evening he shall be clean. So think about this. If we are sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer, and if we are sprinkled with the Holy Spirit, and immediately realize this glory, we would be in heaven. Okay? Who would be left here on earth to sprinkle the unclean? We are now God's children who are the clean that can sprinkle the unclean. We are now the priests mediating on behalf of the people to God. We are the mediator between man and God saying, you need to accept Christ as your personal savior from your sins. You need to repent and turn towards him. We are the mediator sprinkling the gospel of Christ on people. <clears throat> okay, this word purify himself. Can we purify ourselves? We've already dealt with this. No, we cannot. But we need to allow Christ. We need to receive. We need to be willing. This is free will. We shall purify ourselves and be ready for Christ's return. Okay, we are not totally sanctified yet. We are in the process of sanctification. And this is a picture of the bride presenting herself holy and blameless to God. She has received the sprinkling and she continues on until sanctification on the seventh day. We are still defiled with death because we have touched death, Christ's death. And we are unclean until evening. We are unclean until the end of our day when we die and we will be actualized and realized in heaven. And we will eventually become glorified in Christ on the seventh day with our bodies. And everything is put back to the way it was before the fall in the garden that's what all this temple is about getting back to the garden this reminds me this offering reminds me of a scripture that uh shows us that we really cannot comprehend these things god is laying out for us it is so deep that we would never understand it until after the fact and in john 14 25 to 29 he says these things i have spoken to you while being present with you but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remember all things that I have said to you. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You have heard me say to you, I am going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I am going to the Father for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. Okay, I believe God is telling us that we're not going to fully understand all of these things until after the fact. And when it happens, we will know. We will understand. And we will see that God's word stood, even though we didn't understand it fully before it happened. Okay, this takes me back to the word Kukha. It's an ordinance. It's a statue that you keep. You don't even understand it. You just keep it based on the promises of God. This is faith. And without faith, you cannot please God. Okay. Verse 20. But the man who is unclean and does not purify himself, that person shall be cut off from among the assembly because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of purification has not been sprinkled on him. He is unclean. So you can't come to God's presence contaminated with sin and death. You need to be cleansed. You need to be born again through the waters of purification, the blood of Christ. This is a picture of free will. Okay. You don't have to come into God's presence if you don't want to. 
You can stay unclean. That's free will. But if you're going to come to God's presence and you want to be where he is, you have got to come clean. You have got to be purified from your sin and death. Otherwise, you will never make it to heaven. And the way that we do this is through Christ. Christ is the door. He is the way. And we need to take communion seriously. If we take communion in an unclean manner, we are drinking God's wrath upon ourselves. We need to be meditating and saying, man, these are the sins that I want to be cleansed for. I need my feet to be washed. Before I come before you, cleanse me from my sins so that I can come where you are. <clears throat> Free will is also shown in Revelation 22, 11. It says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he that is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. This is free will. If you want to stay in your sin, you have the free will to do that. If you want to be cleansed, you have got to come through Christ. He paid for it all. He did it all for you. Just receive it. Cleanse yourself. Receive it. Okay. Verse 21. It shall be a perpetual statue for them. He who sprinkles the water of purification shall wash his clothes, and he who touches the water of purification shall be unclean until evening. Think about that child, that story, that kid that needed to be cleansed from deadly poison. This is what we are. We have deadly poison on us. We have death. We have sin. That we have gotten on us. And that same water that purifies the unclean makes the clean unclean. Jesus, he is our red heifer. We have to come through his death. Death is the thing that makes us unclean. It's the result of sin. He told Adam that in the day you eat of this, you shall surely die. Jesus died. Death is unclean. And we are going to get dirty while in this world. We're going to do things we don't want to do. We are going to touch dead bodies. But more importantly, this is the spiritual understanding. We are going to become defiled, but only until evening. Okay, the end of our day. We need to die to ourselves and live for Christ. And we look forward to the new day, the new beginning. The eighth day is the new day. We look forward to that day, the end of the final millennium, the end of the seventh millennial day. Okay, Numbers 19. Whatever the unclean person touches shall be unclean, and the person who touches it shall be unclean until evening. <clears throat> We are all born unclean, stained with the first Adam's sin through blood, bringing death. We are still tainted with death all the way to Adam. And we will still die physically. But death has been defeated through death. His. Jesus refers to this as sleep in the scriptures. And we need to get back to heaven through the second Adam. Jesus and his cleansing blood that cleanses us from the tainted blood of Adam who brought sin and death into the world. If we are sprinkled with Christ's blood, then we will only be unclean with his death until we die at the end of our day. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. <clears throat> Why? Because we have come through his death. Death makes unclean but we are sprinkling Christ's death on people. So we are participating in that death so that they will be made clean. This is why we are unclean until evening. We should be sprinkling Christ's death on people. We are, we are handling the ashes and the offering and the blood and sprinkling on people so that they can be cleansed. That's why we're unclean. We see this in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians 4, 9 to 12. 
verse 10. It says, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for the sake of Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us, but life in you. Isaiah 25, 8, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trump will be sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 55. Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, Hades, where is your victory? Amen. This offering has many things tied to it, okay? We see the virgin birth tied to this. Jesus without sin being born of a virgin. We see the free will that you have to receive the sprinkling or not. We see Christ's deity in this offering. We see his humanity in this offering. We see the all-sufficient atonement of sin in one offering, cleansing us from sin and death. We see Christ's resurrection the third day. We see the return of Christ, and we will remember his day until he comes. This is the seventh day, okay? The Trinity the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, Aaron, Eliezer, and the heifer are pictured in this uh, offering also. In 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44, it says, So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and a spiritual body. And this is why I'm telling you that anytime you read scripture, it's telling you about the physical, the natural understanding that we can understand, the tangible that we have right now. We need to understand the spiritual. This is what this is pointing to. All of this on earth is gonna pass away. The spiritual will live forever. And this is what we need to be concerned with. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 to 49. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was a living soul. And the last man, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. How be it, that was not first, which is spiritual, but which is natural. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. And as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Okay? Now think about what you've learned so far in temple service and the offerings. Is Christ our offering? Yes. If he did not follow the scripture, could he be our valid offering? No. Do you believe scripture tells us exactly where Christ was crucified? Where and why? I do. Let's put, look at Hebrews 13, 9 through 13. Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines. There's your yoke. Do not be yoked to other doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats, which are not pure profited them that have been occupied therein we have an altar wherefore that they have no right to eat which serve the tabernacle for the bodies of those beasts whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the priests for sin are burned outside the camp wherefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered outside the gate so let us therefore go unto him outside the camp bearing his reproach so where does scripture say jesus was offered outside the camp if he was to fulfill all the scripture 
then he has to be offered as an offering, as the scriptures say. If not, then he's an invalid offering. Okay, I've always wondered why we don't see him being offered in where everybody says he was, Isaac was offered in the brazen altar in the temple. If he was our offering, that's where most of the offerings took place. Well, that offering was for individual sin. Those ashes were carried out every morning to this place, this altar outside a camp where the congregational offerings take place for the people once for all. One offering for all people. This isn't individual sins, but all of these individual sins are represented here by carrying the ashes out to this place. So you see that all offerings are represented and seen in this one place, the congregational offerings and your individual offerings represented in the ashes that are put here. Okay, but guess what? Think about this. Jesus is all of our offerings. He's our high priest. He's our offerings. Uh, well, wait a minute now. If he's our priest, doesn't he have to fulfill the priestly requirements? If Jesus is our offering, and he is the high priest doing the offering, then Hebrews 9.14, it says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works, to serve the living God. So here we see that Jesus not only is the offering, but he is also the one doing the offering, the priest. Well, then how did he fulfill the requirements of priest? Well, the priest was anointed with oil. Was Jesus anointed with oil? In Leviticus 8, 12, the law says, and he poured the anointing oil upon Aaron's head and anointing him to sanctify him. Okay, we see this reflected in Jesus in Matthew 26, 6 to 7. And when Jesus was in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster flax of very costly fragrant oil, and she poured it on his head as he sat at the table. So oil is symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And was he anointed with the Spirit? In actuality, this is a physical picture of pouring oil on, is a understanding of the spiritual. Was he spiritually anointed yes he was at the baptism at john matthew 3 15 and 16 and jesus when he was baptized went up straight away out of the water and lo the heavens were opened unto him and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and lighting upon him this is jesus being filled with the holy spirit so not only was he spiritually anointed he was also physically anointed fulfilling the law Bethany, the house of Simon the leper. Why is that in scripture? Well, I went to look up Bethany and Beit Ani comes from Beit Ana and Beit is a house. So Ana means to answer, respond, or provide an answer. And you remember what Abraham did? He called this place Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. So he will provide in this place. And the temporal adverb of ani, ana, is ata, okay? And it means now. And this adjective of this word is iti, and it means timely or ready or fit. This was the timely fit one that carried Jesus cross. Simon of Cyrene was the physical picture of Jesus being the timely fit one, the AT. And I'll talk about that in part four. This is uh, the fulfillments, okay? Right now, I'm just gonna focus on the uh, priestly part. Leviticus 8.35 says, Therefore shall you abide at the door of the tabernacle or congregation day and night, seven days, and keep charge of the Lord, that you not die, for so I am commanded. So the priest, before the offering, had to stay in the temple area, day and night, seven days, in the holy places. Has Jesus fulfilled that? Okay, this is stated in John 12, 1. It says, then Jesus, six days before Passover, came to Bethany. So here he is, Bethany, the backside of the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is a holy place. Uh, that's where the other altar is, outside a camp. 
And I believe this is a picture that may be showing us that Jesus fulfilled this particular part too of being here seven days, Passover being the seventh day, remained either at the Garden of Gethsemane or at the temple during his stay, keeping himself clean, okay? Now we also see that uh, the high priest needs to have the ash of the red heifer and living water sprinkled on him to be clean person who is able to do the offerings for the people and be the mediator. So who is clean enough to cleanse our great high priest? Jesus is our great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Who is able to cleanse Jesus? These little kids tainted with Adam's sin are not gonna be able to do this. Who will? Luke 22, 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. Here he is fulfilling the red heifer. He is the great high priest who needed to be cleansed with the ashes of the red heifer in living water, which is his sweat and blood. He is the red heifer and he is the only one cleansed clean enough to do this offering. So here he is. He cleansed himself with himself so that he can be our great high priest offering himself, cleansing us from sin and death. The temple understanding and all these offerings are shadow pictures pointing to Christ. Adam and Eve was cast out of the garden east of Eden, east outside the camp. This is a picture of the altar that was placed outside the garden. The Holy of Holies is a picture of the garden. We are wanting to get back to the garden and we can only do it through Christ. It is his blood and his living water that gets us back. He is the door. We have to be cleansed before we go back and we need to come through him, through the way the narrow way, the straight way through his blood in his water in his death. So just as a dirty child, Jesus gave us a bath, but in the process, he became unclean with our sin and our death. Now, everyone who touched him became unclean because he was unclean until evening. And when he appeared to Mary, he said, Mary, don't touch me. He was clean and headed to heaven to make atonement with his blood. Remember when uh, he came back after atoning for the, uh, with his blood in heaven, he came back and he was later seen that evening walking to Emmaus with the disciples. He was seen by Mary and uh, he told Thomas to now touch him. He had been cleansed from death. He had a glorified body. And now we can eat a meal with him. But first, we need to be cleansed from death. So how can the source of defilement make something clean? He was unclean while he was under the law of Moses. The passion of the cross externally. But he was not defiled internally as we are with Adam's sin. He was not tainted with this sin nature, this corruption. When he died, our sin and death, he was just unclean until evening. He rose again on the third day. And he was the clean person doing the sprinkling on us. He sprinkled us with his blood and water from his side. Okay. He was not tainted with Adam's sin, his sin nature. When he died in our sin and death, he was just unclean until evening. He was the clean person doing the sprinkling on us. He sprinkles us with his blood and his water from his side. And out of the side of the first Adam came his bride, Eve. And out of the side of the second Adam came his bride, us. The virgin birth points to Christ not being defiled with the sin of Adam from Mary's egg that was tainted by Adam's sin, 
when we are sprinkled with Christ on the third day, we touch his death and we are unclean until evening, but we will be clean on the seventh day, the seventh millennial day. We will be able to live forever in glorified bodies. We are now clean and we can sprinkle the unclean with his blood, the gospel. And when we take communion, we remember his death until he comes. This is the only offering that purifies, the only offering that cleanses death and sin, and we will appear with him in glory. So I hope you appreciated uh, what God has done for you. This offering is a very, very beautiful offering. It points to Christ in more ways. And this is the offering that we know the least about. Uh, Leviticus has really become my book that I call Love Leviticus. And it's because of this. When you understand Leviticus and numbers the way you're supposed to in Christ, it teaches you the physical understanding of what you can relate to that God is trying to show us in the spiritual what he has done for us. This is such a beautiful offering. And I hope you have enjoyed this. Uh, part four will be the crescendo. This will be the uh, fulfillments of all that we've learned here and all of the typological shadows and pictures that pointed to Christ. And I said all, but it won't be all. There will be so many that I, I can't do it all. All of scripture points to this point in time, this offering when Christ came and fulfilled it all. And there's no way I can do any justice. I can't touch all points, but I'm going to touch specifically on points that I've never seen before because I never understood the law. Now that I understand it a little better, I just want to pass these on to you so that you can understand better what Christ has done for us in understanding these offerings. So if you have not been sprinkled with Jesus, the ashes mixed in water, blood of the red heifer Jesus. I pray that you will today. That's the only way you're going to get into heaven is repent of your sins, seek him and his forgiveness and ask him to cleanse you from your sins and save you from death. And he will. I guarantee it. That is the one prayer that he will accept and he will hear from someone who's defiled with sin and death. Save me. Save me, Lord. Save me. He'll do it. Hope to see you in heaven someday.